Now accepting his re-election in his speech, Jeremy Corbyn promised to launch a national campaign against the government's plans to bring back grammar schools. Now that comes after the Labour leader, of course, scored a rare victory against Theresa May during Prime Minister's questions the other week and in doing so managed to unite the Labour Party behind him on that issue. Well, the Cabinet Minister and Chairman of the Conservative Party, Sir Patrick McLaughlin, joins me now. Uh, very good morning to you, Sir Patrick. Well, let's start then uh, ahead of your mm. conference next week with the issue of, of grammar schools. Hasn't it given the Labour Party a, a stick to beat you with and to unite itself? Well, I, d I don't accept that at all. We published a green paper on what we want to do for the future of education. Uh, this means uh, concentrating on those schools who are doing very well. So uh, academies, you have uh, sports academies, you have music academies. I think it is right that, uh, as uh, Justin Greening has said, that we need to uh, look at academic achievement too and give people the opportunity to attend those schools. Yeah, but haven't you yourself uh, said in the past, and a lot of people now saying it, Jeremy Corbyn said it in the House of Commons at that Prime Minister's questions, uh, what you used to support, it seems, was good schools in all areas for all people. Yes, and that's exactly what this uh, programme is. At the moment, even when the last Labour Party were in government, there were grammar schools in certain parts of the country, and I, uh, I don't see why they should be in certain parts of the country and not available in other parts of the country. And that's exactly one of the things that Theresa May and Justin Green, Greening wants us to, uh, to uh, put right. Well, as I say, it's uh, one of the issues that uh, seems to have got uh, many members of the Labour Party behind Jeremy Corbyn. Of course, he was re-elected again with an increased majority, as you well know. Are you one of those people, in spite of the fact of your loyalty to the Conservative Party, that almost regrets that the Labour Party is so divided, so split and so apparently weak, that you need a strong opposition in this country? Well, look, the Labour Party's got to look after itself. I mean, the simple fact is, you've got the position now where the Labour Party have got a leader, where 172 of his own MPs didn't fit, think that he was fit to lead the Labour Party, let alone fit to run the country. But while we're in government, we've got the responsibility of uh, pursuing uh, the people's wishes as far as the referendum is concerned. That's what we're doing. And also addressing issues right across the sphere of government. So be it in the health service, be it in education, be it in international development. And we will show over the next three and a half years why it's so important to re-elect a Conservative government. It's interesting though, isn't it, Sir Patrick, as uh, we're here discussing uh, divisions within the Labour Party, uh, we find today just how deep the divisions in the Conservative Party were and are over that EU referendum. And uh, this I'm referring to the book by Sir Craig Oliver, who you know very well, who ran the referendum campaign and was at the Prime Minister's side as Press Secretary for many years, the former Prime Minister's side, I should say. And this issue of Theresa May not really batting for Remain, she let down Mr Cameron. That's the allegation. Well, I don't think that's true at all. I mean, the simple fact is this is being written after the event. Theresa May, during the referendum campaign, made her position very clear and uh, made uh, public uh, pronouncements and, indeed, public speeches. But there were lots of people in the referendum campaign, be it from the, the Chancellor, the then Foreign Secretary, to the leader of the opposition, the leader of the Liberal Party. There was uh, a number of people that were making the case to remain, but at the end of the day, the British people decided that we should leave. And now it's the job of Theresa May and the people around in the Cabinet uh, to deliver on that, uh, on that result. But did you really think at the time, Sir Patrick, that she was pulling her weight? According to Sir Craig, they referred to her, Mr Cameron and others referred to her as the submarine. Theresa May was below the surface, not well, this out is, there. Really this is a book. for Remain. Well, this is a book that's been written after the event, and no doubt there are interpretations after the event. Um, you know, you've got to say, you've got to have certain spicy things in a book to sell it. Uh, I don't blame uh, Craig for doing, uh, for doing that, but uh, at the time, Theresa was a very much part of the Remain campaign. But as she has rightly said, the British people have come to a decision, and we've got to carry out now the results of the referendum, which is to leave the European Union. OK, right, but that is, we know Brexit means Brexit, but uh, we've been hearing from the former Chancellor, haven't we, about what kind of Brexit, and it's been termed soft or hard. Where do you stand on that, the hard Brexit being we, we get out come what may, and if that means then no membership or no access to the single market, so be it. 
Well, let's wait and see. I, I realise this is frustrating because we're not going to give a running commentary on exactly where we are with the negotiations. Part of the negotiations, if, if we were to air them live or keep giving running commentaries, um, that would uh, reduce our negotiating position uh, as we enter into those negotiations. So I know that uh, on programmes like this and, and other programmes, we're going to be pressed to give more information. I'm afraid we're going to have to uh, resist the temptation as to whether I'm hard Brexit, soft Brexit, medium Brexit. Um, what we are <laughs> is leaving the European Union, but trying to get the best deal, obviously for the United Kingdom, but also, the, the rest of Europe has to acknowledge too, they sell goods to us as well as us selling goods to them. Let me put another uh, formulation then, nuanced Brexit. Uh, George Osborne's description of the voters fairly close, so therefore even all those in the Brexit camp weren't, let's say, of the UKIP persuasion, for instance. Well, look, the, the simple fact is, as George, I'm sure, will have acknowledged, the referendum was decisive. It was very clearly that we should leave the European Union and we'll have those negotiations. And George will be part of that debate. I mean, George will be exercising his, uh, his uh, views as a backbench member of Parliament, which he's more than uh, capable of doing, uh, trying to influence that debate. But we can't in government give a running commentary on exactly where we are on every aspect of the, uh, the issues as they go through. But what do you think about uh, George Osborne's visibility compared with that of his former boss, David Cameron, the two commanding figures of the party over the last decade? Do you think George Osborne should be more like Mr Cameron and uh, a period, a prolonged period of silence would be more appropriate? I don't... George wants to contribute to the debate. George has said that he's staying actively in the House of Commons and I very much welcome that. He did a fantastic job as Chancellor um, and he's taking a bit of time now to uh, see what, uh, what else is going on. As far as David Cameron's concerned, I saw David uh, in the week and uh, he accepts that his time at the top of politics is over and he's um, thinking about what he wants to do.